divided into two parts. I'll give the first hour and Mateusz will give the second hour. I'm using slides. The slides are in German and I toyed with the idea of actually speaking in German, but I think it's more important, but then there are some people who express the fear of that. So I think we'll do it in English. I really would like you to understand the math, but the, the slides are in, in English. So from matrices to tensors, um, we all know that a general three by three matrix has three linearly independent eigenvectors uh, over the complex numbers, say. And one question I like to address is how many eigenvectors does a three by three by three matrix or three by three by three tensor have? So a tensor looks like this. It's a three by three by three array filled with 27 numbers. And uh, if we're lucky by the end of the lecture, I will be able to uh, answer this question. Was ist das Bild? What's the picture? So this is the notices of the American Math Society, July 2016. Uh, most what's in the lecture is in this article called Tensors and their Eigenvectors. And this picture is an illustration of the, uh, the spectral theory of tensors. So this lecture has four parts. The, uh, the first two deal with linear algebra. So this is linear algebra that uh, most of you, hopefully all of you, will be familiar with. So in the very first part, I'll talk about symmetric matrices. Then uh, I'll move on to general matrices. So allgemeine Matrizen means general matrices. Uh, and then we'll move on to multilinear algebra. We're going to talk about symmetric tensors and then uh, general tensors at the end. So I'd like to ask the question, why do we learn about matrix calculation? Why do we learn linear algebra? So my nephew is in 11th grade in Frankfurt and I asked him, what does he do in math? And he says, matrices, matrix calculation. This is in 11th grade in the gymnasium. So why do we do this? Why do we learn about computing with matrices? as a university student, and in some cases, as a high school student. So let's start with symmetric matrices. So in the day and age of data science, they describe covariance among random variables. So in statistics, symmetric matrices are particularly important because they de describe uh, dependence, independence structure, covariance structure. On a more pure math side, algebraists really, really like quadratic forms. So Q here is a quadratic form in three variables, X, Y, and Z. And uh, this homogeneous quadratic form can be written in terms of matrices. So symmetric matrices in algebra serve as a data structure for representing quadratic forms. Well, in a vector space with a basis. So, so my vector spaces have bases. So so this symmetric three by three matrix represents uniquely this quadratic form Q, which I've written out in expanded form up there. So this is, these are two reasons why you might want to study symmetric matrices. Now you might look at the gradient of the quadratic form. So this is the vector of partial derivatives. So the gradient vector here is a column vector is the vector of partial derivatives, dq dx, dq dy, dq dz, and up to a multiplicative constant on two, the linear map given by the gradient map is exactly the linear map that's represented by this matrix. So every symmetric matrix, every square matrix represents an endomorphism or vector space. So linear map from the vector space R3 to itself I'd like to start with the observation that the linear map, the self map given by a symmetric matrix up to a factor of two is exactly the map given by the gradient, evaluating the gradient. So the gradient, if you take partial derivatives of a quadratic form, then you get linear forms, and then these are the linear forms. So here on this slide, we now have three motivations for studying symmetric matrices, statistics, quadratic forms, and then lastly, the linear maps, the self maps of R3 in this case, given by such a symmetric square matrix. Now the principal axes of an ellipse or ellipsoid is something that uh, people study sometimes in high school. So here is a, a quadratic form in two variables, X and Y. 
and we've expressed it in terms of the principal axes. So algebraically, I've taken the quadratic form and I've written it as a linear combination of two squares of linear forms or in matrix notation, equivalently in matrix notation. So here's the same quadratic form represented by a two by two symmetric matrix and the uh, transformation to the uh, principal axes corresponds to diagonalizing the uh, symmetric matrix by the eigenvectors. So here the columns one, negative two and two, one are the eigenvectors. So here we have the orthogonal matrix of eigenvectors. Here we have the uh, transpose and uh, with this transformation the matrix diagonalizes and then we get the representation on the right. So the top equation in matrix equation is down here. So this is called, I think in the English language, often called the spectral theorem. I learned recently that's also known as Jacobi's theorem, I think in German. So the theorem says that the eigenvalues of a symmetric real n by n matrix are all real. That is a miracle, right? Because the characteristic polynomial of an square matrix in general can have real and complex eigenvalues, but it's one of the miracles of mathematics that a symmetric real matrix has all of its eigenvectors real. And then the second part of the miracle is that the eigenvectors actually are very special. They form an orthogonal basis of R to the N, just like the two column vectors here, one, negative two, and two, one, are an orthogonal basis of R2. Please interrupt me if there's any questions. A word about eigenvectors. So Q continues to be a quadratic form represented by a symmetric n by n matrix. We will say that a vector V, a column vector V is an eigenvector if it's mapped to itself up to a multiplicate constant by the gradient map. So here we just agreed that this is the same as taking the gradient. So if the gradient map takes a vector, it maps it to itself up to a multiplicative constant lambda, then we're calling V an eigenvector of the quadratic form. Here we're allowing lambda to be zero. In fact, we're also allowing lambda to be uh, uh, zero, complex numbers. Um, so in geometry, it's advantageous to identify two vectors if, I, if they differ by a multiplicative scalar. So I'm going to say two vectors are the same if one is a non-zero multiple of another one, and that takes us from the vector space R to the N to the projective space, so we identify two vectors if they're parallel. So with this, we can argue away the lambda, so the eigenvectors of a quadratic form Q are the fixed points of the gradient map. So the quadratic form has a gradient map, and then we simply take the, the gradient map uh, in projective space, and a fixed point of this gradient map in projective space, by definition, is an eigenvector of the quadratic form. Let's do an example. So here's the quadratic, here's the quadric in the three, two variables we had before. So now we're identifying two vectors of length two if they're the same up to a global constant. So then the gradient map goes from the projective line P1 to itself and it's the usual linear map described by the matrix or the gradient map. So it takes a, a point x, y on the projective line. It maps it to 3x plus 2y colon 2x plus 6y. And this map has two fixed points, the fixed points with coordinates 1, 2 and negative 2, 1. These fixed points are real by the miracle known as the spectral theorem. And by definition, these are the eigenvectors or eigenpoints of the quadratic form. So that's all I had to say about symmetric matrices. Are there any questions about symmetric matrices? Uh, can you come back to the previous slide of decomposition of that vector? This one? Yeah. Can you please? So, so I have uh, the decomposition up there and I claim that the equation on top in matrix vector form is exactly the same. So I'm splitting this up. The middle matrix I'm splitting up into two matrices. I take the sum of this matrix where I'm zeroing out 
this entry plus the other matrix where I'm zeroing out that entry. Okay, so this is a diagonal decomposition. Passing, diagonalizing the quadratic matrix is equivalent to finding the sum of squares decomposition. <coughs> and the entries you see in the sum of squares, the coefficients you see, are the eigenvectors or eigenpoints of the quadratic form. Okay, now why do we study general rectangular matrices? So we talked about quadratic matrices being motivated from a variety of contexts. Well, quadratic matrices, square mat I'm sorry, rectangular matrices represent bilinear forms. So algebraists like quadratic forms, but they also like bilinear forms. So here in B, with a bilinear form on the product of two vector spaces of dimension two and three respectively, and a, a general square, I mean, a rectangular matrix, a rechteckige matrix, a general rectangular matrix furnishes the data structure for a bilinear form. So here, the bilinear form is on a vector space with the two coordinates u and v, and then on the other side, a three-dimensional vector space with coordinates x, y, and z. Now what about the linear map that, represent, that is represented by a rectangular matrix? Let's apply the same principle and contemplate the gradient of the object. So, well, the gradient of B, B is a, a bilinear form, so we have partial derivatives of B with respect to the variables u and v on the one hand. Well, these partial derivatives will be linear forms in x, y, and z. On the other hand, we have the partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. They will be linear forms in u and v. So because of this separation, it makes sense to uh, think about the gradient map. So the, the gradient map on the face of it is a, a linear map from five-dimensional space to itself. But it kind of makes sense to think about this five-dimensional space as R3 plus R2 mapping to R2 plus R3. Another way, we're combining, fassen zusammen, we're combining the right multiplication and the left multiplication. Right? If you have a rectangular matrix, if you have a rectangular matrix, you have to sort of generally make up your mind. Right? When you learn linear algebra, you have to make up your mind whether you want to multiply this matrix on the right by a column vector, and you call that the linear map given by that matrix. Well, that will take a vector in a big space to a vector in a small space. On the other hand, you might prefer the opposite. You like to multiply with a row vector on the left, which in this example would take you from a small space to a big space. Now, what if you cannot make up your mind? Well, then you do what you do here. Namely, you simultaneously organize the right and left multiplication together. And we're going to interpret this here as the gradient map, simply the map given by the partial derivatives of the bilinear form B. Now what I just described is intimately connected to the theory of singular values and singular vectors. So in data science, if you have a rectangular matrix, what you do is you do PCA, principal component analysis, or SVD, singular value decomposition. So let's recall that. So B is a rectangular M by N matrix. Let's look at the following two equations. Bx equals lambda Y, where X is an unknown column vector. Lambda is an unknown constant, and Y is an unknown column vector. So the first column vector X has length N, the second column vector Y has length M. But at the same time, you would like to have B transpose Y to be lambda X. So it works in both ways. Now, if we have a solution x, y, lambda to this system of equations, then the following things will be true. It will be the case that x, the column vector x, will be an eigenvector of the symmetric n by n matrix B transpose B. You just substitute one equation into the next one, and you see that x is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda squared for the symmetric matrix B transpose B. By the same token, y, the m vector y, is an eigenvector of the symmetric m by m matrix B, B transpose. 
So these x and y's you recover as eigenvectors of the associated symmetric matrices of different size. Lambda squared is the corresponding eigenvalue, so it's an eigenvalue both of B transpose B and B B transpose. So, so the common usage, the übliche Sprachgebrauch for rectangular matrix, we say that lambda is a singular value, and we're going to take it to be a positive, non-negative real number. Then x usually is referred to as the right singular vector of the rectangular matrix. Y, written as a row vector, is usually written as the left singular vector. But we're going to look at them together. We're going to refer to x, y as a singular vector pair. And, uh, well, these things are very important, right? So I don't have to tell you, ask the local engineers why singular values and, and singular vectors are important. Now, how can we think about this geometrically? Well, let's think about fixed points again, right? So B is a bilinear form in M plus N variables, as before, represented by a rectangular M by N matrix. So now we look at the gradient map. So we have uh, the X variables, N of them. We have the Y variables, M of them. We take the partial derivatives with respect to the x's. They will be linear forms in the y's. And in the second entry, we have the partial derivatives in the y's. They will be linear forms in the x's. And again, for convenience, we would like to work modulo scaling. But now, we're going to work not in a single projective space, but in a product of projective spaces. So x1 up to xn are homogeneous coordinates on a first projective space, Pn minus 1. Y1 up to Ym are homogeneous coordinates on a second projective space, Pn minus 1. And then this is the familiar map. So this represents the two linear applications given by the matrix. And it's a situation where you cannot decide whether a rectangular matrix represents a linear map by right multiplication or by left multiplication, but the news is good. You don't have to decide. You can take them at the same time. It is simply a self-map on a product of two projective spaces given by the gradient vector. Now, the fixed points, x, y of this map, by definition, are the singular vector pairs. So uh, if you go to the wiki and you look up singular values, you find this definition. But to think about the pair x, y, the pair of a left and right singular vector, you should think about this geometrically as a point in this product of two projective spaces that is a fixed point of the gradient map. So such a fixed point is a singular vector pair. That's it. So this was my summary of linear algebra. So linear algebra, let's summarize linear algebra. First of all, Linear algebra rules the world. You know that uh, scientific computing rests on numerical linear algebra. So scientific computing, a lot of enterprises, you know, the, the ones you're familiar with and use every day on your cell phone, right? We all know that linear algebra and numerical linear algebra for large matrices is very, very important in the world. And a quick summary, so we talked about symmetric matrices Q, and they are important for example, because they represent quadratic forms. Rectangular matrices B are also important, wichtig is important, because they represent bilinear forms. Now the linear maps that we usually normalize associate with these matrices can be thought of in terms of the gradients of these expressions. So the quadratic form Q has a gradient vector, so does the bilinear form. These gradient vectors have linear form entries, and the linear maps represented by these matrices are the linear maps that you're familiar with. We're interested in the fixed points of these linear maps up to scale, and in the first case, we call them the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix, and in the second case, we call them the singular vector pairs of a rectangular matrix. And of course, there are corresponding orthogonal decompositions. So the orthogonal decompositions of our matrices. So the spectral theorem says that if you have a real symmetric matrices, then uh, we can replace it by a diagonal matrix. And there's a coordinate change by an orthogonal matrix U. And likewise, in the SVD, if you have a rectangular matrix B, 
You can make a rectangle or diagonal matrix with non-negative entries here, and now you have two orthogonal matrices, an orthogonal M by M matrix O1 on the left, and an orthogonal N by N matrix O2 on the right. So this is my summary of linear algebra. Very good, so if there's no questions or complaints, we're gonna move on now and we pass from linear algebra and matrices to nonlinear algebra and tensors. Let's start out with the symmetric case. So just like in the matrix case, let's start out with the symmetric case. So we're gonna look at an N by N by N tensor. Now that's an, a D-dimensional array um, that has the indices, I1 up to ID. I will say such a tensor is a symmetric tensor if I can permute the entries, uh, the indices and the tensor is unchanged. So you can check that the number of distinct entries in such a tensor is n plus d minus one choose d. So, so for d equals two, this is the familiar situation for matrices. So a square matrix has n squared entries in general. But if that square matrix happens to be symmetric, there are only n plus one choose two distinct entries in a symmetric matrix. Now the simplest tensors of all are the rank one tensors. So a symmetric tensor has rank one. Well, if there is a vector that governs everything, so if there's a, a vector V of length n such that I can make the tensor entries by just multiplying appropriate vector entry. So if the I1, I2 up to ID entry in the tensor is just the product of the entries I1, I2 up to ID of the vector. I'm gonna call that a rank one tensor. A tensor has rank R if it's a sum of R rank one tensors but not fewer. So this notion of rank is consistent with the notion of rank of a matrix. So a matrix has rank one, if it looks like this. If it's a product of a row and a column vector, and a matrix has rank R, if it's a sum of R such uh, matrices, but not fewer. Now here's a problem. So this was known as the Comon conjecture. So Comon is an engineer at INRIA in France. He came at this from signal processing, and he asked the following question. Is the rank of a symmetric tensor always equal to its rank as a general tensor, okay? Well, let me explain this by giving you the affirmative answer in the matrix case. So the answer is yes, if D is two, if we talk about matrices. So suppose you have a symmetric matrix U, okay? Now, and suppose this matrix has some rank R. Now what that means is that this symmetric matrix can be written as a sum of R rank one matrices but these rank one matrices themselves do not have to be symmetric, right? So I have a symmetric matrix, I write it as a sum of R of these things, but the sum ends a priori need not be symmetric matrices. So that's it. So we might have a, a decomposition of a symmetric matrix as a sum of possibly non-symmetric rank one matrices, UI transpose VI. That's another miracle of linear algebra. There's another miracle of linear algebra that says you can take any such non-symmetric rank one decomposition of a symmetric matrix and replace it by an equivalent decomposition with the same number of terms where each sum end is in fact symmetric. Okay, that's a, a fact of linear algebra. So dig deep in what you know and you can prove this question. If uh, we consider a cube as a three-dimensional tensor, mm -hmm. we can consider its faces as, uh, as metric. That's, that's right, right, yes. And what is the difference between having symmetric matrices in all faces and symmetric tensor and... I see, cube? okay. So those are different. So the question is, suppose I have a three-dimensional tensor, so for example, a Rubik's cube, a three by three by three tensor. What is the relation of this three-dimensional tensor with its 27 entries being a symmetric tensor and the matrices that you see by slicing being symmetric? So these are different notions. So if you write out the con condition, you will see that these are different concepts. So the tensor being symmetric, 
um, is different from requiring that the, the, the slices are symmetric matrix. In fact, they will not be symmetric matrix. Is it a necessary condition to have every two, um, every matri uh, matrix of the tensor should be symmetric to, to have a symmetric tensor? Well, I mean, this matrix will have its counterpart somewhere else. Think about a symmetric matrix, right? So a matrix is symmetric. Well, if you focus on a single column of a symmetric matrix, you don't see much, right? It's just some column like 17 minus 5, 28. But what makes it symmetric is that somewhere else in the matrix, there is a row that's the same thing. So that's maybe the way to think about it. So you have some slice or some face of your three-dimensional tensor. When you look at it, you may not see that the whole thing, you may not get any hint that the whole tensor is symmetric, but somewhere else there will be some other slice that, that you'll see. Okay, so the answer is yes, if d equals two. So this was an open problem and that has occupied people for some time. And then Yaroslav Shitov last summer shocked all of us by coming up with a counterexample. So Yaroslav is here. He's here this week on this floor. Please speak with him. And Mateusz, he will... He will be there tomorrow as well. Okay. So he found yeah. a 800 by 800 by 800 symmetric tensor which is, you know, as a symmetric, as a, as a tensor, its rank is three, 903. So it's a tensor of rank 903. But as a symmetric tensor, its rank is 904. Okay, it's a brilliant construction. So I would say the uh, readers of this paper have been struggling. I think we now believe a year later that uh, it's probably okay. But uh, this was a guiding problem in this field for some time. People believed that the answer should be yes, but uh, Yaroslav uh, shocked all of us by coming up with this counterexample. So this area, the transition from what's very familiar um, from matrices to tensors, there are lots of interesting questions that uh, are beginning to be answered. Did yes. Did anyone make progress to three, you know, four, four? three tensors? I mean, is this, is 800 some? Oh, can, the make, the, can this be made smaller? This is a three-dimensional tensor. This is, a three this is a plane curve of degree 800. <laughs> yes, question. So the symmetric rank is if you count how many uh, you are, how you can um, decompose with the sum of. That's right. Uh, symmetric terms, exactly. And you need 904. But if it's non symmetric, you can do it with 903. And yes, people are looking at this, and there's ongoing discussion about uh, whether we can make these numbers smaller. Question. Uh, what is the connection? Uh, between this common conjecture and combinatorics, why is it posted in the combinatorics section of archive? Oh, why is this in the, okay, well, as you can imagine, so this gentleman is very, very good at solving problems, and he sort of picks combinatorial computer science problems. So I think he thinks of this as a complexity theory problem, and, and the construction is actually very combinatorial. So, so people in computer science, complexity theory are interested in this, and and the construction is, is a mix of the different techniques, but it definitely has a strong combinatorial flavor. Um, but let's step back and let's understand a little bit. Uh, let me give you a quiz, okay? So I have such a large group, so let me ask you a little quiz. So a three by three matrix a priori has nine distinct entries, but a symmetric three by three matrix has only six distinct entries. Likewise, a four by four matrix has 16 entries, but if it's symmetric, there are only 10 distinct entries. So let's practice how to do this for tensors. So if you have a general three by three by three tensor, it has 27 distinct entries. But now suppose this tensor is a symmetric three by three by three tensor. How many distinct entries does it have? Or here, the bigger Rubik's Cube, so a four by four by four tensor has 64 entries. But how many distinct entries does a symmetric four by four by four tensor have? So I'd like to maybe invite the people in the last row. So what about the symmetric three by three by three tensor? Tobias, what do you think? How many distinct entries? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> So it's uh, three to the three plus. Okay, so these are indices i, j, k, and the requirement is that the, in the, the entry in position i, j, k is the same as the entry in position i, k, j, 
is the same as the entry and position Kij and Kji and make a guess. Yeah. 10. Okay, the answer is 10. There are 10 distinct entries. How about the 4x4x4 four by four by four tensor? Anybody have a guess for that? 15. Okay. So these are good, so if you study, if you see this for the first time, these are good exercises. So the how many question is always a good question. It's always good to think combinatorially, right? So if you don't, if you have a little bit of a hard time learning a new concept, it's always good to ask the how many questions, right? How many entries are there? So a symmetric 3 by 3 by 3 tensor has 10 entries and the 4 by 4 by 4 tensor has 15 entries. Now, a good way to remember that is because symmetric tensors are exactly the same thing as homogeneous polynomials, right? So symmetric tensors are the same as homogeneous polynomials. So if you have a symmetric tensor, you can take its entries, ti1, i2, up to id, and write it in this manner as the coefficients of a polynomial in n variables, x1 up to xn, that is homogeneous of degree d. Now you're very familiar with this in the case d equals 2 because a quadratic form, if d equals 2, quadratic forms are exactly in bijection with symmetric matrices. Likewise, higher degree homogeneous polynomials are in bijection with symmetric tensors. Now once we have represented our symmetric tensor as a polynomial, we're ready to do the same thing we just did, namely we can take the gradient map. So, the gradient of t is a vector of length n, the ith coordinate of which is the partial derivative of t with respect to xi. Well, if t has a degree d, then the partial derivative has degree d minus 1. So the gradient of t is a vector of n homogeneous polynomials, each of which is homogeneous of degree d minus 1. Now this gradient vector defines a map from R to the N to just by plugging in, right? So you have a vector of length N, each entry is a function of N variable. So by plugging in, you have a, a map from Rn to Rn. I'm going to say a vector V is an eigenvector of T if it's fixed up to a scalar. So if the gradient map takes a vector V and up to a multiplicative constant, it maps it to itself. So uh, lambda here, well, we could also make it convex, complex. We can allow zero. And just as before, for convenience, we can identify two vectors if they differ by a scalar multiple. So we're going to replace the vector space r to the n by the projective space of one dimension less. And by definition, the eigenvectors of uh, our tensor or of our homogeneous polynomial are the fixed points of the gradient map. So we agreed that this was the case 25 minutes ago in the special case d equals 2 and for d equals 3 and 4 and 5 it is exactly the same definition and the same concept. Now eigenvectors of tensors are not new. They are very very old idea so they come up for example in the following ancient optimization problem. So suppose you have a homogeneous polynomial T with real coefficients and you'd like to maximize the value of this polynomial on the unit sphere. So the unit sphere is all vectors where the sum of the coordinates squared is 1. Now how do you solve such a problem? Right, you learn in calculus, to, this is a constrained optimization problem. So I want to maximize the polynomial subject to the constraint that x1 squared plus x2 squared plus plus xn squared equals 1. So we learn in calculus that we apply the method of Lagrange multipliers. So there's one constraint, so there's only one Lagrange multiplier lambda. And then you write down the, uh, the critical condition and the critical condition looks like this. You look at the gradient of t evaluated at some point v and you want it to be equal the Lagrange multiplier lambda times the gradient of the sum of squares. So uh, this is the equation. So the eigenvector equation is exactly the Lagrange multiplier equation for maximizing your homogeneous polynomial on the square, on the, on the sphere. So here we have uh, an example. We have a uh, t is a symmetric. So t is a symmetric 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 tensor. The experts, how many distinct entries does such a tensor have? 
So it's a ternary sextic, isometric, three by three by three by three by three by three tensor, and it has how many distinct entries? Okay, 28, right? So this has 28 coefficients, this degree six polynomial, and this is the graph of this function on the unit sphere, right? So think about this as the height of some landscape on planet Earth. So there are mountain tops, those are the maxima we're interested in, there are valleys that would be the local minima. Now here I picked a particularly nice sextic, so this sextic has 20 local maxima, that's the largest number. It also has uh, 12 local minima. Altogether, there are 62 critical points. So this uh, has 62 critical points on the sphere. But since we're doing this in the projective plane, so there are 31 eigenpoints. So this symmetric 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 tensor has 31 eigenvectors. So those are the eigenvectors of T. And in this case, I picked a nice example where the Morse complex of this optimization problem is the octahe is the icosahedron, right? So there's a, there are 20 local maxima, there are, let's count this, 20 local maxima, then 30 saddle points. If there's a Switzerland, there's usually a restaurant at the saddle point, and then there are 12 valleys where you sleep at night in the hotel. So those are the eigenvectors. So the restaurants, the mountaintops, and the rest, and what did I say? The hotel's in the valley, the restaurant's on the mountain pass, and the uh, the mountaintops are the eigenvectors of this symmetric tensor. So let's come back to the question we asked at the very beginning. So a, we set out to answer the question, how many eigenvectors does a symmetric three by three by three tensor have? So this picture is one thing we learned in this lecture. We learned that a symmetric three by three by three tensor with its 10 distinct coefficients, come on in. Come on in, guys. You can maybe grab a chair over there if you like, and there's lots of space, so there's chairs back there. So this is a symmetric three by three by three tensor. It has 10 coefficients, and that is the same as a ternary cubic. That is the same as a homogeneous polynomial of degree three in three variables pictured on the right. right? So this is a cubic curve in the plane. There's the zero set in the real projective plane knows as an elliptic curve. Right? So, so the one take home message from this lecture is these are the same picture. So a symmetric tensor like this is the same thing as a plane cubic curve. So if you have this polynomial of degree three, our question is how many critical points can such a cubic polynomial have when you look at critical points on the two sphere? And the answer is seven. Okay, so let me convince you that the answer is seven, is even. So it turns out for this problem, uh, this very special cubic exhibits the general behavior. So I'm looking at the diagonal tensor, which as a polynomial is the Fermat polynomial, x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed. So, so our, under our identification of polynomials and tensors, so you fill this Rubik's cube with lots of zeros, except there are entries one, there are three entries one along through the diagonal of this cube. Right? So you put a one along the diagonal. Now then, what are the eigenvectors? Let's recap. So we're supposed to look at the gradient vector of this. So the partial derivatives are three x squared, three y squared, and three z squared. Now since we're working in the projective plane, we can divide by three. We're not in characteristic three, Justin. Okay, we can divide by three. So therefore, the gradient map is simply the map that squares the entries coordinate-wise. So it's the squaring map that takes x, y, z and maps it to x squared, y squared, z squared. Okay, now what are the fixed points of this? Well, there are seven fixed points. They're simply these zero, one points in the projective plane, right? So every vector whose coordinates are zero and one is a fixed vector. The all zero vector is not allowed in the projective plane, and of course we're working up to scaling. So if I write one, zero, one, that's the same thing as 17, zero, 17. So there are seven of these, and I'll explain the color coding in a moment. Okay, those are the fixed points. So there are seven eigenvectors for a three by three by three tensor. The general formula is given here by, uh, by this uh, generating function. So suppose T is a general symmetric n by n by n by n tensor. 
Now we have to again, just like in the typical matrix case, count the complex solution. So the number of complex eigenpoints is this expression d minus 1 to the n minus 1 divided by d minus 2. So if d is 2, it's better to use the formula on the right hand side, right? So, so let's check that. So if d is 2, so in the matrix case, we add up d minus 1 to its power. So we see 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus, it's n. An n by n matrix has n eigenvectors, okay? And, uh, and of course, you know, in the, uh, in the case where n is 3, we get 7, 13, and so on. On 31, if, if, uh, if uh, what do we say, if d is 6, okay? So these are some references in brown. So just as a test case, so how many eigenvectors does a 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 tensor have? I'm very tempted to ask you how many distinct entries this tensor has. In fact, I'm very tempted to ask Emra, but that's a cubic surface, right? So this is the same as a homogeneous polynomial of degree 3 in four variables. Such a polynomial has 20 terms. So this tensor has 20 distinct entries. Now, if you want to visualize this, you can, as you suggest, right? If you have a tensor, you can take the slices and wrap, separate them out. So you hold this four-dimensional tensor in your hand and you slice off the three-dimensional slices. So that's one way to draw this four-dimensional tensor. And this picture is the same as a cubic surface. This is a cubic surface. It has 27 lines on it. OK. Um, what, what is D in the, in the theorem? Hmm? What is D? D is the degree of the polynomial. So the tensor T is a homogeneous polynomial of degree D in n variables. So if d is 2, this is a matrix. If d is 3, the three-dimensional Rubik's cube, and so on. So, so in, this example, in this example, d is 4, because it's a four-dimensional tensor. And then the side length of the tensor is 3. That's the n. Yes, question. Uh, if all these numbers are equal, the polynomial representing it is unique. But if they are not equal, the polynomial need not to be unique? Uh, what do you mean if they're all equal? Oh, I mean, if, if, the, if it's not a symmetric tensor? Okay, we have to get there. So I'm so slow, you know? So we still have, let's, let's get to general made tensors in a moment, okay? A quick remark, of course, the reality, let's get real, right? So Paul Breiding, who is here somewhere, proved a very, very nice theorem. He said, well, how many real solutions are there on average, right? So what can we expect about the histogram of real solutions? So let me illustrate this uh, in the case of 3 by 3 by 3. So we know the complex count is 13. So there are always 13 complex eigenvectors. Now the real count will be odd. So 1 is possible, 3 a lot, 5 quite a few, 7 still some, 9 few, 11 very few, 13 very, 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 very few. Okay? And, uh, the average is 3.56. So Powell gave a very, very nice expected uh, uh, formula for the uh, expected value, Erwartungswert, in terms of uh, a certain hypergeometric integral. So this is, uh, fits under random tensor theory. So this, in random algebraic geometry, we're interested in real, typical real behavior of these kind of figures. And we saw an engineering-inspired talk on this this morning. And, uh, and this is, uh, in this context, you all know about random matrix theory. So this is a contribution to random tensor theory. Now in general, if the right bar is so low, is it possible that we can always have all eigenvectors real? Right? That's a question. And the answer is yes. So this was known for a while. So the first non-trivial case is n equals 3. I'd like to actually give you the, the proof in this case because it's a very, very nice proof that illustrates the concepts we've learned. So, uh, so the formula of n is 3, so this is now a 3 by 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 3 tensor. And the number of fixed points is 1 plus d minus 1 plus d minus 1 squared. So that's the 7 and the 13. So I'm going to give you a tensor such that every complex eigenvector is real. Okay. Okay, I'm going to give you the tensor. Are you ready? Okay. Well, the tensor is the following. You take a product of linear forms. So let's actually, let me show this. Okay, so let T be a product of D 
general linear forms and three unknowns. So geometrically, I draw D random blue lines in the plane. If I multiply them, right, I multiply these linear forms, I get a homogeneous polynomial. Homogeneous polynomials, same thing as a symmetric tensor. That's my tensor, okay? Now, what, now how do I count the eigenvectors? Well, certainly I have, there are D choose two red intersection points, right? I have D lines, any two lines meet in a red point. That is a singular point of the curve, so that is an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. So there are D choose two eigenvectors with eigenvalue zero. Now I also claim that every region, so this arrangement of lines in the real projective plane divides the real projective plane into regions. These regions are convex polygons, triangles, quadrangles, pentagons, and so on. And every polygon, convex polygon, has a God-given special point right in the middle called the analytic center. Okay? The analytic center is the point at which the interior point methods in linear programming start. Right? You know that in linear programming nowadays, often you use interior point methods that start right in the middle and then perform a path towards the optimal vertex and the place where you start that. That's called the analytic center and those are also critical points. Now let's count the number of regions, right? For example, if there are four lines in the plane, how many regions does this divide the plane? One, two, three, Okay, let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, four, five, six, seven, four. We're in the projective plane, right? So in the real projective plane, four blue lines divide the plane into seven regions. Now that completes the proof, right? Because in general, there are D choose two plus one regions. The sum of these two numbers is the upper bound. I've constructed this many real eigenvectors the number of real eigenvectors I constructed matches the complex upper bound, so therefore it's attained. So this was the state of the art for a while until another brilliant young mathematician came along. That's Kash Ghali, who is here maybe or anywhere in the Epsilon neighborhood. So he surprised us last year. He came by the institute, he met me, and his first sentence says, first sentence he said to me was, I solved your problem. That's a very good way. If you meet a senior mathematician, you know, for the first time, that's a very good opener. <laughs> good morning, I solved your problem. Okay, so he showed that uh, a general real symmetric tensor of arbitrary format can have only, uh, cannot have all its complex eigenvectors real. And the construction is a little different. So it uses, uh, this is sort of combinatorics and Karsh's uh, construction is more analytic. So it uses harmonic, uh, spherical harmonics. You asked about general tensors. So now the fourth part of the lecture is about general tensors. So where are we at? We started the lecture with symmetric matrices. Then we sto spoke about rectangular matrices. Then we moved on to symmetric tensors. So now let's talk about general rectangular tensors. Now algebraists, they like bilinear forms, but they also like multilinear forms. So a tensor is a data structure for encoding a multilinear form. So if you have a general N1 by N2, blah, blah, by ND tensor, then that's the same as a multilinear form. Now let's apply the same recipe we've applied the, same, the whole hour. Let's look at the gradient vector of this multilinear form. So now, there are D groups of variables, right? The first group of variables are homogeneous coordinates on the first projective space, the second group of variables, and so on, up to the last group of variables. So if we take the partial derivatives with respect to a variable in the first group, well, we get a multilinear form in the other variables, and so on. So it's quite natural to think about the gradient map as a self-map this, from this product of projective spaces. Now, for some of you, this looks very, very general and abstract. For some others of you, this might look very, very special, right? And if you're in the second camp, then toric varieties are a very good setting for understanding this. So if you like to do this more generally even, then toric varieties are good, but let's stick with this setting in this lecture. So we have this self-map in a product of projective spaces. Well. What are we interested in? We're interested in singular vector tuples. So the singular vectors of a tensor come as a d-tuple. 
And those are the fixed points of this map. So here's a theorem that was proved by uh, Friedland and Ottaviani in 2014 who counted the number of singular vector tuples of a general tensor. So suppose you have a, a general tensor T of format N1 by N2 by ND, then the number of fixed points of this map, the number of singular vector tuples is given by a generating function in D formal variable. So the formal variables are Z1 through ZD. I'm going to write ZI hat for the sum of everybody except for the ith. And then I write down this polynomial. So this thing is a polynomial. So I take uh, ZI hat to the NI minus ZI hat to the N. You want to ZI to the NI divide by the difference and I multiply them up. Now this is a big polynomial and this big polynomial has a very, very special monomial, namely the monomial Z1 to the n1 minus 1 up to zd n d minus 1. So this monomial codifies the dimensions that you see in the projective space and that coefficient is the number of singular vector tuple. Let's do an example. Let's go back to the Rubik's Cube. So now the Rubik's Cube is a non-symmetric 3 by 3 by 3 tensor. I fill it with 27 random numbers, distinct random numbers. And I claim there are 37 singular vector triples. So I apply the formula, so Z1 hat is the same as Z2 plus Z3. I multiply this out, and then uh, this is the self-map from a six-dimensional variety to itself, P2 times P2 times P2 to itself, and the coefficient of Z1 squared, Z2 squared, Z cubed squared is 37. So what have we done? We looked at the trilinear form in three groups of variables. We form the partial derivative, so this gradient vector has bilinear entries. And then uh, this self-map for P2 times P2 times P2 has 37 fixed points. I'm almost done. I, it remains to tell you about the picture. So in the second slide this morning, we saw the picture on the cover page of the July 7, 16 issue of the notices of the AMS. So let me end by explaining that picture. I'm going to explain that by talking about the case of a 3 by 3 by 2 by 2 tensor. So by the friedland ottaviani formula, suppose you have a 3 by 3 by 2 by 2 tensor, in general has 98 singular vector quadruples. However, if you have an orthogonally decomposable tensor, these are very special. So the Fermat example showed that in the symmetric case, orthogonally decomposable tensors exhibit the general behavior for eigenvectors, but not so for singular vectors. So here's a orthogonally decomposable tensor. So I have uh, four groups of variables, x0, x1, and x2, homogeneous coordinates on P2. Then I have y0, y1, y2, then I have zero, z0, z1, and finally w0, w1. So this very special, you know, multilinear form is a tensor and we can calculate the gradient vector and then the, the fixed point. So the, this has a, a gradient map that takes this six-dimensional space to itself, but it turns out there are only 18 isolated fixed points. In addition, there's a fixed surface. There's an entire two-dimensional surface of fixed points, and this surface is a combinatorial surface. It has many, many irreducible components, so let me explain that to those who have uh, drawn polyhedral pictures. And so in toric geometry or symplectic geometry, people draw these kind of pictures. I'm going to speak about this for just a minute. So I have these four factors. I have a green P2 with its green homogeneous coordinates x0, x1, and x2. I have a blue projective plane P2 with its homogeneous coordinates y0, y1, y2. I have a red projective line with its homogeneous coordinates z0, z1. And finally, I have a yellow projective line with its homogeneous coordinates W0 and W1. The fixed point locus is represented in a polytope. So this toric variety, like every toric variety, is represented by a convex polytope, the sixth dimensional convex polytope that I get by taking the direct product of a blue triangle, a green triangle, a red line segment and a yellow line segment and that's what you see in the boundary. That's the fixed point locus. So the faces 
of such a multichromatic convex polytope or multichromatic and this is the surface in the boundary that's the fixed point locus. Time is up so uh, I thank for your attention so we started out with linear algebra and matrices we took a slightly different take on why matrices are interesting and how you get to matrices but it then led us quite naturally to uh, tensors and uh, well, what are the message? So summary, facet, right? So uh, the first message is in the first row, these two pictures are the same. A three by three by three symmetric tensor has 10 coefficients. It is the same as a homogeneous polynomial of degree three and three variables. It defines a cubic curve in the plane, elliptic curve on the upper right. Then, you know, higher degree, we saw that the special tensors might give us nice eigenvectors. We also saw that the concept of eigenvectors of tensors is not a new one. It's a hundred or more years old. Uh, as soon as you so formulate an optimization problem on the sphere, you then Lagrange multipliers leads you naturally to this concept. And the middle, well, there are these two uh, journal covers. So that's a, a shameless advertisement of a journal I'm involved in. Thanks for your attention. Okay, good morning. And uh, this talk will have certain repetitions with Burns' lecture. I really hope to make it slow and understandable. With examples, please ask questions and we will, we will see how the notion of rank uh, depends on the tensor and what are the differences between matrices and tensors. But we start with well-known objects from linear algebra, just, in the, just as in the previous talk with matrices. We fix a matrix, an A times B matrix. And the first question is for you, what is the rank of A? What's the rank of a matrix? Maximum of linearly independent number of vectors. Which, Which vectors? vectors? Row vectors. No, color vectors. <laughs> Maximal linearly independent row vectors. And that's a miracle. It's also maximally maximal linear independent number of columns. I can restate it because as we know matrices, they give linear maps. So I can also say that this is the dimension of the induced image map, ima of, of the image of the induced map, either from KB to KA or from KA to KB. So these two things, I can also restate it that the rank is the dimension of image. Okay, so two are done. I ask again, what's the rank of a matrix? Can you do it using some polynomials, equations? Vanishing of minors, yes. So it's the smallest R such that r plus 1 times r plus 1 minors vanish. Very good. And I want one more point that people maybe don't stress so often, but uh, what is a real building block, what are the easiest matrices, are rank 1 matrices. And Bernd defined rank one matrices in a previous lecture as, as, as a product of two vectors. So the ijth entry is vi times wj. So rank one matrices are easy. Let me, let me recall that rank one, rank one means that the ijth entry is a product of vi times wj for some vectors. 
W and V. Can you express a rank of a matrix just using the notion of rank one matrices? It's the smallest um, you know, representation of some. Yes, so it's the smallest R such that our matrix is a sum of R matrices of rank one. Okay, <clears throat> so a lot of these things are known. Maybe even you know all of those things and maybe even you find them obvious. If you don't find them obvious, think about them and try to prove them. But if you think about it deeper, you, you can feel that as Bernd said, it's a little miracle that all of those things coincide. Now, there are a few consequences of of these facts, and uh, one of the consequences is that if I fix matrices of rank at most R, I get what? That's a consequence of point three. What's the topic of, uh, big topic of those lectures? I get an algebraic variety. Yes, I get a zero set of polynomials. So a consequence, a corollary, is that matrices of rank at most R form an algebraic variety. Yes, you know equations. These are just all R plus one minors of, of a matrix. Now, there are other corollaries of, of, of these facts. And again, they would seem obvious to you, but if you think deeper about them, maybe they are not so obvious. I have not specified a field here. If I give you a matrix and I ask for its rank, I basically don't have to do it. If I give you, give you a real matrix, well, I don't have to tell you that this is a real or a complex matrix. I mean, a matrix with real entries can be treated as a matrix with a complex entries, but the notion of rank does not depend on it, yes? A minor, an R plus one minor vanishes or not. It's either zero as a real or as a complex number. Is it clear what I mean? For example, if you look at definition four, this might be not so obvious. Why, if I have a real matrix, maybe there, are, there is a smaller number of complex rank one matrices that is needed to represent it. But when we look at definition three, this becomes obvious. So this is an indication that maybe these this equivalences are more interesting than, than they seem. So that's first corollary, the second uh, rank, rank of re real rank, rank of a uh, real matrix is equal to, of a real matrix A, is equal to rank of a complex, but the same matrix A. It doesn't matter if I treat it as a complex or as a real matrix. Now, a third miracle already mentioned by Bernd is that I can restrict to symmetric matrices. And of course, if I ask you what's the rank of a symmetric matrix, where a symmetric matrix is a matrix and you can give me the four answers above, but you can improve point four. Anyone remembers what was one of the miracles mentioned by Bernd? How do I define a rank of a symmetric matrix? How can I define it? As a sum, as a minimal R such that A so it's the smallest R is 
such that A And now what should I write? Yes? Symmetric AI? Yes. AI are symmetric. Again, you maybe know this theorem and maybe you, you find it obvious, but if you think about it, it's not so clear that you can make those AIs symmetric rank one matrices. So this is a short maybe reminder or maybe a short sum up of, of ranks of matrices. And the aim of the second part of today's lecture is to try to find or maybe try not to find analogous statements for tensors and see how these definitions change when we go from matrices to tensors. Okay. And the leading definition one definition that will be the most important that you have to remember it and it's just taken from matrices in, 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 in any possible way is the notion of a rank one tensor. <clears throat> if you like abstract uh, algebra, you think about tensors as element of uh, of a tensor product of D vector spaces. If you prefer combinatorics, you think about it as a A1 times A2 times A3 times AD box filled with numbers. Okay? Now, a definition, a rank one tensor T is a tensor that is just a tensor product of vectors. So if you think about the tensor space in this way, that's the end of the definition. It's just a tensor that can be represented in this way. If you think about this definition, what does this mean? It means that the I1 I D entry of this tensor represented as a multidimensional cube is just a product of V1 I1 times VD ID. If our tensor would happen to be a matrix, which means we just take D equal to two, then this def definition clearly coincides with the definition of a rank one matrix. And we will see throughout this lecture that rank one tensors <coughs> behave in a very nice way. They behave very much similar to rank one matrices. So, in particular, one shouldn't change the definition of a rank one tensor. This is the correct one. Let's try to understand the geometry of rank one tensors. And for that, there is a variety that you know from previous lectures. First of all, we notice that whether T is of rank one or not, does not depend if we multiply it by a scalar. So maybe instead of looking at this vector space, we can pass to the projective space, projectivization, which just means we look at our tensors up to scalars and we exclude zero. And now a question for you, what does it mean 
to be a rank one tensor in this projective space in geometric terms. What's, what's a variety? Okay, I already say too much because we will have to see that this is a variety, but how would you describe the points in this space that correspond to rank one tensors? Is it the whole space? What do you think? Is it the whole space? Anyone? Is it the whole space? It's a yes, no question. Is every tensor a rank one? Is every element here of this form? No, that's a good answer. So it's a proper subset. What kind of a subset? So this word was already used in several lectures before. It's the image of a Segre product. Now, notice that to specify a tensor, I need to specify a vector in a first vector space, a vector in a second vector space, a vector in a diff vector space. So how do I specify these vectors? Well, to specify a vector in the first vector space, I just take it. Now, to specify a vector in a second vector space, I need now a pair, so I take a product. Yeah? And so on. To specify d vectors in respective vector spaces, I need a product of d projective spaces. And if you remember, there is a Segre embedding. So we have seen many examples of the Segre map in coordinates, also during the Toric lecture, where we worked in coordinates, especially the example P1 times P1 was treated, where we take all monomials that are of degree one with respect to variables in VI. So we take a variable here times a variable here times a variable here times a variable here. That's one way of describing the Segre product. But now we have a more invariant way to describe it, namely to a class of V1, to a class of V2, to a class of VD, we associate the class of their tensor product. And you can check in coordinates that this is the same as the Segre map we defined on previous lectures. So what's the conclusion of this? The conclusion is that rank one tensors, they are the Segre variety. Rank one tensors are geometrically just a product of projective spaces. It was an exercise that I'm sure everyone did to find the equations of the Segre variety. Now, where could this exercise be? So what are the equations of rank one matrices? Well, the equations of rank one matrices are two by two minors. Two by two minors happen to be binomials. Yes, if I have a matrix, A, B, C, D, then the minor is AD minus BC, which is a binomial. And this is a general fact that this image has an ideal generated by binomials. It is a toric variety. So if you want to find generators of the ideal of this variety, you have to go back to the toric lecture, for example, and then there is an exercise how to find. In fact, this will be always two by two minors. And what kind of two by two minors? Okay, let's continue. So if we have this rank one uh, tensors, well, we can look back at our guiding definition for matrices, and matrices gave us linear maps. Now the question is, do tensors give us linear maps? And this was also covered by Bernd. He said it quickly about flattenings and everyone was saying, yes, it's fine. So let's do slowly how to get a linear map from a tensor. From a matrix, that's easy. A matrix is a linear map. I assume you know it. So in other words, now we want to build a matrix 
from a multi-dimensional tensor. And first, I give you a general way to do this, and then we will do explicitly an example. So we take a vector space. Okay, so this is an abstract way. If you have a tensor here, you can build a map from the tensor product, so I is any subset of D. I choose certain vector spaces from one to D. For example, I can choose the first one and the third one. And there is an induced map from the tensor product of the dual vector spaces, V1 dual tensor V3 dual, to the tensor product of all the others. And that's a linear map. If you are familiar with a general definition of a tensor, you can think about it like that. But let's do an explicit example. So let's take a tensor V1 in tensor V3. And let's take I to contain just one element, one. So I have to build a map from V1 dual to V2 tensor V3. Yes, and I can think about my tensor as a three-dimensional cube indexed by i, j, k. Now, as a linear map, this sends EI dual to an element here, which is simply a sum over all possible j, k, T, i, j, k, Ej tensor Ek. So what are these E's? They are just the bases. Maybe I can I should I should use here F and G because these are different vector spaces, not to confuse you. So E is a basis of V1, F is a basis of V2, G is a basis of V3, so Fj tensor Gk is a basis of V2 tensor V3. This is a rank one tensor that has just one one and other entries into e equal to zero. So it's a matrix that has only a one at the position jk. And this is a linear map. If you think about it, it puts the layers of the tensor next to each other to regard them as a matrix. Any questions about this? Okay. So we are done with rank one tensors. We understand them completely and we see that they basically behave like rank one matrices. Now we try to define a rank of a tensor and we will run into trouble. First, let me tell you what's a W state. It's a tensor that is in C2 tensor C2 tensor C2 and it's given by E0 tensor E0 tensor E1 plus E0 tensor E1 tensor E0 plus E1 tensor E0 tensor E0. Okay, what's the rank of this tensor? Well, I haven't told you what's the rank of a tensor, so let me, let me tell you now. Rank of a tensor T. What do you think? What could be a definition of a rank of a tensor? Any ideas? So we will use point four. We will use point four because the others they don't make much sense. 
There are too many maps associated to a tensor. They depend on a choice of i. And minors, well, what would be a minor of a hypercube? It's not so easy to say. But four, we can now define four without any problem. We can say that this is a minimal r, such that t is a sum of ti's, and ti's are rank one. OK? That's a definition of rank. I don't claim it's the only reasonable one, but it's a definition. Now, what's the rank of the W state? Three. Who can see it's three? <laughs> Who can see it's at most three? Very good. So the fact that it's exactly three is an exercise. It is a written exercise in the notes. So you have to prove that no matter what you do, you cannot write it as a sum of two rank one tensors. Okay. And now we have seen that tensors of rank one, they form a variety. But now let us do a computation. We take one over epsilon. Oh, that's a plus. Okay, so this three means that I tensor this with itself three times. And this three means that this is just E0 tensor, E0 tensor, E0. What is this? So maybe first, what's the rank of this tensor? This is a tensor. Also in C2 tensor, C2 tensor, C2. What is the rank of this tensor? Someone said the correct number, but please speak aloud. I cannot speak loud today. Two. Two. So again, you can treat it as an exercise, but this is a very simple, that this is not rank one. And it's clearly at most rank two because there are only two rank one tensors appearing. But if we decompose it using the tensor product property, what we get is the W state plus epsilon times a tensor. I don't, in notes there is a precise expression, it's quite long, plus epsilon square. Uh, in fact, there is E1 tensor E1 tensor E1. Okay, and this is true for any epsilon. Can anyone see what's strange about this? So we have rank two tensors that can be arbitrary near a rank three tensor. That should surprise you. Can you find rank two matrices that are arbitrary near a rank three matrix? No, because rank at most two matrices, they form a closed set. We just proved it. So this means that we can approximate a rank three tensor arbitrary well with rank two tensors. In particular, if we take tensors of rank at most two, this is not a closed set. Yes? This is not a closed set, so it cannot be a variety. That's right. Most of them, I mean, just because you have the distance very small doesn't mean it can't be a small set. I mean, uh, even if it's, if it's a closed set, then it could still have outside the closed sets uh, rank three matrices that are very close to a rank two <coughs> in the closed set. But not arbitrary close. If, it's a if it would be a closed set, then every limit would be also in this closed set. And here we have a limit that is outside of this set. And if, I, if I have a closed set, I cannot get arbitrary close to this point. Yes, but I mean, it, 
all points out of the closed sets are rank three. Then you but this is a fixed point. W is a fixed, one fixed point. I'm not saying that arbitrary close to rank two things are rank three things. I'm saying that to a fixed rank three thing, I fix a point and I can find a sequence of rank two tensors that converge to it. So rank two tensors, they cannot form a closed set. Okay? Okay, so I hope this motivates the following definition. We define the border rank. Is the smallest R such that there exists such that in every neighborhood So in, if in every neighborhood I can find rank 5 tensors, but I cannot find rank 4 tensors, then my tensor would have border rank 5. And now a question for you, what's the border rank of the W state? Someone who hasn't heard about border rank before, can, can one answer such a question? What's the border rank of the W state? So what's the smallest integer such that in any neighborhood of the W state we can find we can find a tensor of that rank? Or at least what would be the candidate integers for that? Could the could the oh yes, but have you heard about border rank before? No. Okay, very good. <laughs> Very good. It could be two or it could be one. Now, who can exclude one of those numbers? By what we already said? By the Segre fact. It's not one? Why it's not one? Exactly, because Segre, so rank one are closed. So if something is border rank one, then it is rank one and W is rank three, and three is not one. So we are left to two, and it has to be two, okay? Now, the obvious fact is that the border rank is always at most rank, but as we see, it can be strictly smaller. Here, we see that for tensors, already some of these definitions diverge. Namely, if we define rank like this, then if we want to get a variety, you need to, we need to look at tensors of border rank at most R, something that forms a closed set. Now, I took this closed and no one asked what do I mean. So ah, I could also define in every neighborhood, well, I could define that tensors of border rank at most R, this is the closure of tensors of rank R. But there is one thing that you haven't asked me. I use the words neighborhood, I use the word closed, and no one asked me what do I mean by this. We have seen, yes? But are we in finite dimensions? Yes, we are in finite dimensions. We are in finite dimensions. I never go to infinite tensors. So in all norms at least, so I could then. But the topologies, there are non-equivalent topologies. And we have found two topologies on our spaces. This was the Zariski topology and the, uh, the usual Euclidean topology. So over the complex numbers, by the theorem we already discussed, Chevalet's theorem, 
the, it doesn't matter which closure I take. The closure of tensors of rank at most R, it will not matter whether I take Zariski or uh, usual closure. But it turns out that over the real numbers, there is a difference. I will probably not have enough time to go uh, in details, but there is, okay, maybe, maybe I should do it because this is, this is important. <clears throat> So what I'm claiming is that if I take a real space and I look at tensors of bounded rank, it may matter whether I take Zariski or Euclidean closure. Is the statement I'm making clear? Okay. <clears throat> to illustrate it, I will work in this space. I claim there is no polynomial that vanishes on all tensors of rank two. That is, they are Zariski closed. But we will see that there is a Euclidean ball <coughs> of tensors of real rank strictly greater than two. I pick a tensor here. And the tensor is explicitly given as E1, F1, G1 minus E1, F2, G2 minus E2, F1, G2 minus E2, F2, G1. Now, because you are used to the case of matrices, there was no complaint. What do I mean by a rank of a real tensor? Well, I defined the rank. Ti's have rank one, but are they real or complex tensors? What do you think? Well, that depends. And as we will see, there is there is a difference here. So a notion of a rank may depend, even if I start with a real tensor, over which field I work. This is a real tensor. It has real coefficients. Okay? Is that fine? It's a real tensor. And our aim is to present it as a sum of rank one tensors. And our first question is, can we fight two real rank one tensors such that T is equal to a combination lambda one or V, V one, W one, or let's say V one, W I, uh, Z I for I equal one, two. Can we find real vectors? Okay, if we can do it, what does it mean? We can look at the associated map from R2 to R2 tensor R2. And if we have such equality, can I find rank one matrices in the image of this map? That's a question for you. I assume that my tensor has real rank two. I contract the first factor. Can I find rank one matrices in the image of this map? Remember, the contraction map just acts on the VIs. Yeah? So for example, I can take here a linear form that annihilates V1 and leaves V2 to one then the image will be just W2 tensor Z2. Yeah? If I take a linear form that puts V1 to zero and V2 to one, then the image will be a rank one 
matrix. Is it fine? Okay, so let's compute this image for our tensor. Well, it's a two-dimensional vector space of matrices. First, we act by E1, and we get a matrix of this form. F1, G1, that's a one here. F2, G2, that's with a minus one here. Now, be honest with me. Can you see that if I act with E1 dual on this tensor, I get this matrix? Who can see that? <laughs> Some people can, but many cannot. That's just this example. Remember, when I act with EI dual, I just leave the things that had I. So if I act with E1 dual, I forget those things that had E2, and I'm left with F1 G1 minus F2 G2. I get this matrix. Okay, so now you have to tell me what happens when I act with E2 dual. What kind of matrix do I get? Come on. The minus ones on the off diagonal? Yes. Okay. So the space, the image of this map is A minus A, B, B. That's the two-dimensional space that is the image of this map. What are the rank one matrices of this form? What are the rank one matrices of this form? <coughs> the determinant should vanish. Yes. A equals plus or minus i. No real solutions. No real solutions. So this tensor for sure cannot have real rank two. Because if it had real rank two, we would find rank one real matrices. But it has complex rank. It has complex rank two, and I can just give you it explicitly that this is a half of E1 plus E2 e tensor three plus E1 minus E2 e tensor three. So this is a rank two complex tensor that happens to be equal to T, so T also has rank two. It doesn't have rank one, that's a very easy exercise for you. So you should be surprised here. I took a real tensor and its rank depends whether I see it as a complex tensor or as a real tensor. A case completely different than the obvious case of matrices where the two notions coincide. You can also read off this decomposition because these are the complex matrices. I mean, this picture has to also go through, but now we get a complex rank one matrix, and you can find complex rank one matrices of this form, where the determinant vanishes. Any questions about this? Okay, very good. So to sum up, the tensors behave, high rank tensors behave in a very different way than matrices. Their rank may depend on the field. Tensors of bounded rank, they do not form a closed set. And whether, whether yes, it depends on the field. They do not form a closed set. And there is one more thing. This argument remains true if we perturb T a little bit we will also not find rank one matrices in the image. This subspace will be disjoint from the rank one matrices, which means that there is a small Euclidean ball of rank three real tensors around T, which means that the Zariski closure and the usual Euclidean closure of tensors of real rank at most two differ. Some people are nodding. If if you are lost in the last th sentence, think about it at home. It's a very nice picture what happens. There is an equation known as the tangential variety uh, of the segre on which the change happens. What's the real rank? It's a hypersurface. 
Now let's do some geometry. We have a projective variety X in some projective space. And we define, first of all, given points P1 up to PR in the projective space, we define the projective span to be the smallest projective space or subspace containing all PIs. Yeah? So if I have two points, it's usually a line. If I have three, it's usually a plane. Okay. Now I define the secant variety, the kth secant variety of x, that's by definition the closure of the union of p1 up to pk for pi's in x. So I take all possible k tuples of points in x, I take the smallest projective subspace that contain them, I take the union, this is an infinite union, and what I get might not be closed. I close it. Okay? So a quick question for you. If I take the R secant variety of PA1 times PAD, what is this? In the language of tensors. What is it for r equal 1? What's the first secant variety when k is equal to 1? I take smallest projective spaces that contain a point. That's just a point. So I get the union of all points over the variety. So I get back the variety. Yes? So when r is 1, I get tensors of rank 1. Yes? Can you see that sigma 1 of x is just x? And these were tensors of rank 1. What happens when r is larger? Uh, Matthias, ju just a definition. Yes? There you, you take the union over pi, and then there we have the square of p1 to pk. Yes, so I should write all possible tuples, p1 up to pk in x. Okay, where each element is in x. Yes, every single one element is in x. Okay, so what happens when this is a product of projective spaces? Every point is a rank one tensor, yes? And now I take a subspace that they generate. So these are tensors of rank at most R. Okay, so this without the closure would describe tensors of rank at most k or r, yes? With the closure, this is border rank. Okay, now, I hope this clarifies a little bit the difference among, among those uh, definitions and uh, the, the definitions for tensors, that these, there are big differences. But there was this comment about, about symmetric matrices that I already erased. And now let's do the geometry. Let's go back to Burns' lecture and let's try to define a symmetric rank of a tensor. So now I take, I take T a symmetric tensor. So 
So what's a symmetric tensor? You should remember from Bern's definition that the entry doesn't depend on the index up to permutation, or that all the matrix slices are symmetric, or that it's invariant under the permutation group, or that it's represented by a polynomial, or that it belongs to the symmetric power of the vector space. These are all the same things. Okay, so what's a rank one symmetric tensor? Who remembers? What is a rank one symmetric tensor? There are thousands of equivalent definitions. Give me just one. Power of a linear form. Power of a linear form. That's maybe a hard one because we used to think about tensors as boxes or about elements of this type. So if we think about tensor product, what's a rank one symmetric tensor? How do I write it as an element of a tensor product? Yes, yes it is a rank one in, in the usual sense, but if if I want to write it, I don't know. It's like V1, tensor V2, and maybe a sum of such things. What's a rank one symmetric tensor? The V1 and V2 must be equal. Yes. So it's V tensor, tensor V. Okay? This is how you can think. So there are, you can think about it as a power of a, and if this is D, then this is Dth power of a linear form, and the linear form is represented by V. Now, another geometric question for you. What's the geometry of rank one symmetric tensors? This is the other variety that goes back almost every lecture. So there is the Segre variety and there is the Veronese variety. Now, we just need to specify one vector V. So this is a map from the projective space to, well, if you remember, it's really the diff symmetric power of V, but you can think about it in that it is in V tensor, tensor V, and it just sends a class of V to the class of V, V, V times V, or to the class of V tensor, tensor V. This is the same up to scalar. If you think about this as linear forms, up to a change of coordinates, it sends a linear form to its dth power. Okay, so a definition, a warring rank of a always symmetric tensor T is minimal r such that t is equal to the sum where ti are symmetric rank one tensors. And what Bernd mentioned, the important thing to notice is that now the miracle for matrices does not hold. And the miracle for matrices was that I could have erased this symmetric here and the definition was the same. Right now, it matters even if I take a symmetric tensor, whether I require these TIs to be symmetric or not. In every single example you will encounter in your life, this does not matter. But there exist examples where it does matter. By the way, now you are in a position to define warring border rank. So what would be warring border rank? Is anyone courageous enough to make a definition of a border rank, for, of a border rank analog? So when a symmetric tensor has border warring, R, warring rank R, We just have two minutes, someone has to do this, and my throat is worse and worse. Yes, please. Yeah, we have um, yeah, we neighborhood symmetric tensors of rank R. Of warring rank R. Yeah. Okay. And 
What would be the geometric statement here? It's the R secant of the Veronese. It's the R secant of, of the Veronese. Now, I should give you some challenging exercises because usually I give you very easy exercises. So the challenging, rank, uh, challenging exercise, which is in fact an open problem, is that we do not know whether for symmetric tensors, border warring rank and border rank agree. Yes, so if a tensor is symmetric, we can ask what is its border rank. We can ask what is its border warring rank, and we do not know if the two numbers are equal. For rank, we know that in general not. But for border rank, it's still an open problem. Probably not, but you have to find an example. Sorry? Yes, for small ranks, it's true. For small ranks it's true, and the proof is because we know equations for small ranks, and we can check that the variety is the same. It's cut out by the same ideal. But, but this is only for like really small ranks. Okay, and some other open problems, just to end. I want to tell you how bad the situation is with describing rank and border rank for tensors. So if we, if we take matrices, what's the highest possible rank? N. And can you give me a matrix of rank N? Identity. Identity. Okay. Now, what's the highest rank or border rank in CN tensor CN tensor CN? Well, you probably don't know this, but at least one of the exercises estimates the order. And this goes quad quadratically with N. There are coefficients, but both maximal rank and border rank, they grow quadratically with n. But if I ask you to give me examples, explicit examples, like the examples that the computer can understand, so I don't allow you to use pi, e, but let's say small integers, then there are not known explicit tensors of rank greater than 3n or border rank greater than 2n. So a generic one will have huge rank and border rank, but we cannot find examples that have large, even linearly large rank and border rank. And this is one of the big obstacles to prove, for example, lower bounds that certain algorithms cannot be fast, like the matrix multiplication. Thank you very much.